Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. On May 19, 1921, a man claiming to be the plumber appeared at the door of the Summers family home in San Francisco, California. He told the Summers' eldest son, Charles Jr., that there was a leaky gas pipe that needed to be fixed. Charles immediately ushered him inside and showed him the steps to the cellar. As the plumber descended the stairs, he found Charles's 12-year-old sister, Mary, playing with her dolls. Suddenly, Charles heard a scream come from the cellar. Racing downstairs, he discovered Mary fighting off the man, kicking and hitting him with all her might. The so-called plumber had attacked her and attempted to wrestle her to the ground. Charles pulled the man off Mary and tried holding him down, but the attacker broke free and ran from the house. Charles chased the man and was able to knock him down several times, but the man escaped after he punched Charles. The perpetrator was eventually caught two hours later. Disheveled and bloody, he was taken to jail and booked on assault charges. The man was no plumber. He was a robber, he was a murderer, and he was a necrophiliac. He earned many different nicknames, including Gorilla Man and the Dark Strangler. But his real name was Earl Leonard Nelson. And Mary Summers would soon learn how lucky she was that her name was not added to his long list of murder victims. Hi, I'm Sarah Hagee, co-host of Wondery's podcast, Scamfluencers. In our recent two-part series, Three Weddings and a Funeral, we dive into the story of a German con man who built an entire life on fake names, lies, and schemes, and the unlikely true crime twist that brought this decades-long charade crashing down. Listen to Scamfluencers on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. From Wondery and Treefort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the second season of Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed lots of murderers, including serial killers. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. It is difficult to get a satisfying answer without diving deep into their mindsets. So that's what we're doing and I will give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is Earl Leonard Nelson, The Dark Strangler. Five years after he attacked the 12-year-old girl, Earl Leonard Nelson struck again. At approximately 1.30 p.m. on February 20th, 1926, Earl who introduced himself as Roger Wilson, knocked on the door of 60-year-old landlady Clara Newman. He was responding to the room for rent sign she posted in the window of her boarding house in San Francisco. As Clara led the potential boarder upstairs to show him the apartment for rent in the attic, they passed her nephew on the second floor landing. The nephew noticed the visitor's olive complexion, short stature, broad chest, and large hands. He also saw that he was carrying a well-worn Bible. 
Less than an hour later, the nephew saw the man again as he was leaving the house. The stranger told the nephew, tell the landlady I'll be back to take the room. After Clara did not come downstairs, her nephew then went looking for her. He discovered her body on the floor of the attic apartment. Clara was nude, had ligature marks on her neck as well as large indentations from the killer's fingers and fingernails. She had been badly beaten and the coroner determined she had been raped after she died, a fact not revealed to the public at the time. Less than two weeks later, on March 2, 1926, the body of 65-year-old Laura Beale was discovered by her husband in a vacant apartment in the building they owned. She had been strangled with the silk belt from her dress. Her husband assumed she had been showing the apartment to a potential lodger when she was attacked. An autopsy confirmed that she was also raped after her death. These two cases began a 16-month pattern of murder and post-mortem rape carried out by Earl Leonard Nelson. Between 1926 and 1927, Earl was linked to 22 murders. The majority of his victims were female and over the age of 50. On June 10th, Earl killed another landlady who was on her way out of her building when he showed up and inquired about a room for rent. This time, the victim put up a fight. Her autopsy revealed she had nine fractured ribs, indicating he used his body weight to hold her down while strangling her. She too was sexually assaulted after her death. After three similar murders, police had eyewitness descriptions of a suspect seen before the attacks and fleeing the scene. Newspapers started referring to the landlady killer as the Dark Strangler and also the Gorilla Killer based on descriptions of his large hands and strange features. For the next few months, Earl murdered women, primarily landladies, up and down the West Coast. One woman in Santa Barbara, one in Oakland, and three in Portland, Oregon. The women were brutalized, strangled, and then raped. The police in Oregon were initially skeptical that their victims were tied to the Dark Strangler because the bodies of the murdered women had been hidden, one behind a furnace, one in the attic, and the other in a trunk, which the Dark Strangler had not done before. But they soon recognized the similarities and joined in the hunt for the murderer. After Portland, Earl returned to San Francisco, where he murdered his ninth victim, a 66-year-old landlady. The very next day, he varied from his usual choice of victim and attacked a pregnant woman in her home in Burlingame, California. She was able to fight him off and call for help. Neighbors chased Earl into the street where he escaped, but finally, the police had an accurate, detailed description of her attacker. Within days of that attack, Earl found his next victim, this time in Seattle, Washington. The victim, a 48-year-old widow who was selling her house, was found strangled and badly beaten in the basement of her home. The autopsy revealed that her cause of death may have been a heart attack during the beating. This time, there was no sexual assault, but she had been robbed of thousands of dollars worth of jewelry that she had sewn into her underwear. A month later, he was in Council Bluff, Iowa, where he murdered a 40-year-old woman. The next three victims were in Kansas City, Missouri. 
Two of them were landladies, but much younger than the others. They were both in their 20s. Earl also strangled to death one of the women's eight-month-old son. Then he traveled westward to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where he killed a 60-year-old woman. Then on to Buffalo, where he beat and strangled a 35-year-old. Two days after the Buffalo murder, on June 1, 1927, he strangled two women in Detroit, Michigan. And two days after that, he was in Chicago, where he murdered a 32-year-old woman. Now you're probably thinking, okay, what's with all the landladies? Did he have some kind of fetish for that? I don't think so. What does a landlady do who wants to rent out a room? She opens the door to a stranger and lets them in her home. Remember, there's only two factors necessary for most male serial killers. The victim has to be female and she has to be gettable. And in Earl Nelson's time, women who rented out rooms met both of those criteria. Police across the United States were now posting public warnings and looking for the killer. With so much scrutiny directed at him, Earl decided to leave the country. A man reported to police that he picked up Earl in Minnesota and gave him a ride to the Canadian border. He then entered Winnipeg, Canada on June 8, 1927. He wasted no time resuming his murderous behavior. The next day, he encountered a 14-year-old girl who was selling paper flowers on the street in Winnipeg. She was never seen alive again. On June 10th, Earl murdered a 27-year-old landlady with a hammer, and police in Winnipeg quickly surmised that the dark strangler had crossed the border. Police immediately began searching all of the local boarding houses. They came across a boarding house where Earl had rented a room, and there they discovered the body of the 14-year-old girl stuffed under the bed. By June 13th, Winnipeg police were offering a $1,500 reward for information that would lead to the Dark Strangler's capture. Earl left and traveled the back roads to escape notice. On June 15th, he reached the small town of Wakapa. Earl entered the town's general store where the owner recognized him and telephoned police. An officer arrived and arrested Earl, who told the officer his name was Virgil Wilson. The officer placed Earl in a cell, removed his shoes, and handcuffed him to the cell bars. When the officer left to call the Winnipeg police, Earl removed a nail from the cell cot and used it to pick the locks. He escaped and fled to the train station and hid in a grain elevator while waiting for a train. The next day, he took a chance and walked to the train station. Earl was recognized by railway passengers who spotted him and alerted a train official who then detained him. Ironically, when the train arrived, it was carrying dozens of Winnipeg law enforcement officers who had come to look for him. Even after his arrest, Earl maintained that his name was Virgil Wilson. He was booked at the Winnipeg police station, photographed and fingerprinted. Canadian police sent those photographs and fingerprints to police stations across Canada and the United States. Several witnesses confirmed that this was the same man they had encountered during murders in the United States. Then, San Francisco police matched the fingerprints to Earl Leonard Nelson. The dark strangler had finally been caught. 
I say, because if I do die, I'm going haunt- to ask the Lord, let me haunt you. We so often hear about those that don't make it out of danger alive. But what about those that do? My body got warm and it just said, get up. You're not done, get up. I'm Caitlin Van Mall, back with a brand new season of I Survived. The more I begged him, the happier and the more excited he got. Join me for new episodes of I Survived every Monday and subscribe now wherever you listen to podcasts. Earl Leonard Nelson was born on May 12, 1897, in San Francisco, California. At birth, his last name was Farrell, the same as his biological father, a Spanish immigrant who worked manual labor at the docks. He married Earl's mother after she became pregnant with him. Their marriage was not a happy or healthy one. Both parents suffered from syphilis, which was at an advanced stage when Earl was born. Syphilis is a highly contagious disease caused by a bacterial infection and is primarily spread through sexual contact. Without treatment, it can be fatal. And in those days, there was no treatment. The discovery of penicillin was decades away. It is believed that Earl contracted syphilis from his mother when he was born. And although it is not known for certain, we do know he had syphilis and gonorrhea by the time he was 13. Congenital syphilis, meaning the disease is inherited, can have long-term effects. And some historians have posited that Earl suffered from neurosyphilis, which can affect one's personality and emotional state, as well as their intellect. Larger than normal limbs or a flattened bridge of the nose are also known physical effects of the disease. It was these traits, along with his massive hands, that led to him being dubbed years later as the Gorilla Man. By age two, both of Earl's parents were dead. He went to live with his maternal grandparents and two of their other children, his Aunt Lillian and Uncle Robert. His grandmother was extremely religious and practiced a fundamentalist version of Christianity. She was particularly fond of the book of Revelations and the apocalyptic stories in it fascinated Earl, a fascination that carried through the rest of his life. Even at a young age, Earl was different from other children in many ways. He would sit in darkened rooms for days, depressed, and then his mood would shift dramatically and his energy would become manic. His depression would sometimes manifest as self-loathing, and he would tell his family that nobody wanted him and that he would be better off dead. Earl would also stare blankly for long periods of time, and when he was walking around, he seemed to be listening to voices, voices that only he heard. Earl would often come home from school missing some of his clothing. Sometimes, even his new garments would be dirty and torn into rags by the end of the day. His eating habits were also odd. For example, he drenched everything he ate in copious amounts of olive oil. And then, like an animal slurping up food, he ate by putting his face in the plate. Schizophrenia, also known as a thought disorder, rarely appears in children that young. But the signs of psychosis, meaning he was out of touch with reality and possibly hallucinating, those signs were there. Earl's extreme mood swings and odd behaviors 
just to name a few, were symptoms of psychosis as well as bipolar disorder. But again, schizophrenia is not often found in children under the age of 12. Those symptoms usually start to appear in the mid to late teens. Bipolar disorder, however, has been documented in children that were only toddlers. At seven years old, Earl was expelled from school. Earl would spend time in class talking to invisible people and quoting Bible passages that mentioned the beast. He scared his classmates, and most of them stayed away from him. Earl had violent fits and lashed out at other kids indiscriminately. And when he was not angry, Earl became the opposite of angry. He became withdrawn and subdued. His grandmother had no idea how to handle him. She did punish him physically, but when he became too big for that, she tried to control him by threatening him with religious damnation. But that did not seem to work either. As a last resort, she threatened to throw him out of the house. That did calm him down for a while, but it only exacerbated his anger and feelings of helplessness. And I'd like to point out, Earl was only seven years old. In 1906, the devastating San Francisco earthquake struck, registering 8.5 on the Richter scale. Almost 500 city blocks were ruined and more than 450 lives were lost. As rumors spread of the looters and armed criminals targeting women, Earl reportedly said he enjoyed the fear that his female relatives expressed about this. In his mind, this was the real life effect of the Lord's vengeance. But a fear of God did not stop him from committing bad acts, although I rather doubt that he could help himself. In those days, there was no treatment and no medication for Earl's mental disorders. Earl was a troublemaker. By the age of 10, he had earned this reputation through a combination of shoplifting and other unpredictable behavior. He once tried to impress some older boys with his daredevil attitude, a stunt that nearly killed him. On his bicycle, Earl raced across train tracks as a trolley car roared toward him. The trolley clipped the back wheel of his bike, knocking Earl headfirst into the cobblestone street. For a week, he slipped in and out of consciousness and had wild fits of delirium when he was awake. When someone is in a delirious state, they may see things, hear things, feel things, and smell things, and think things that are not real. That sounds like psychosis, but it's not. Delirium is strictly physically induced by some kind of illness or trauma or even a fever that the body is going through. On the sixth day, his fits subsided and the doctor proclaimed he was just fine. Little did the doctor know how wrong he was. We have spoken about TBI, traumatic brain injury, and the effect it can have on a growing child. TBI victims may suffer from personality changes, high anxiety, temper flare-ups, aggressive behavior, difficulty navigating and understanding social situations, and a predilection for inappropriate sexual behavior, which we will get to later. Earl was most likely already suffering the side effects of congenital syphilis, and as we detail, his odd behavior was profound. This new injury just put the proverbial icing 
on the cake. For a week and a half, while he was recuperating from his failed stunt, his grandmother sat by his bedside and read to him. He continually asked her to reread a particular passage in Revelations that spoke about the coming of the great beast, a passage he memorized and thought about incessantly. Earl was determined to find out the identity of the beast. As he got older, he came to believe that the beast was alive and wreaking havoc in the modern world. Religious ideation, a delusion associated with religious themes and beliefs, is not uncommon for people who have a thought disorder. A 2012 study about religious content of hallucinations found that sufferers of religious delusions tend to experience more extreme forms of thought disorders. Earlier, we described Earl's auditory hallucinations. These hallucinations happen when a person hears voices. These hallucinations are when a person hears voices and noises that they cannot distinguish from reality. The voices and noises are only in their head. It is unknown whether these early hallucinations were of a religious nature, but we do know from Earl's later words that is what they became. Earl dropped out of school completely at the age of 14. He worked menial jobs, but was rarely able to keep one for more than a few weeks. At the beginning of each new job, his employers were always pleased with their new hire. Earl presented himself as polite and respectful. He was also incredibly strong. His broad chest and shoulders were a benefit to any physical labor jobs. But shortly after he began his employment, his eccentricities would inevitably surface. Instead of completing a task, he got caught staring off into the distance as if watching something only he could see. And sometimes he just laid down his tools and wandered off, never to return. Through all this, his Aunt Lillian was devoted to him. After she married, Lillian allowed Earl to stay at her home rent-free. So he used his money to buy outrageous clothes for the time period, like leather leggings, cowboy hats, and gaudy fake jewelry. Despite Lillian's devotion, she could not ignore some of her nephew's behavior, especially around her female friends. He often let loose a tirade of curse words around the dinner table and stared at the visitors so intensely that they became mm, unsettled and left. Earl walked around on his hands and carried chairs and other furniture with his teeth. Needless to say, Lillian's friends started to refuse to come to her house. By the age of 15, Earl was drinking heavily. That's not surprising. Alcohol is a sedative, a depressant, and many people with severe mental illnesses use it to calm down. Sometimes he would disappear for days or even weeks at a time. He visited brothels and started fights. His sexual appetite was insatiable. His frequent use of sex workers and his compulsive masturbation did nothing to ease it. By 17, Earl's behavior was even more difficult and unpredictable. And Lillian was no longer just worried. She was flat out terrified. Much to her relief, in 1915, Earl left and traveled north, on foot. Along the way, 
He picked up odd jobs to get by, but his main source of income was burglary. He was finally caught while leaving with the stolen goods when a homeowner returned. As a result, he was arrested, and at the age of 18, Earl was sentenced to two years at San Quentin Prison. By the time Earl was released from prison in 1917, America had joined their allies battling in World War I. Using his father's last name, Farrell, Earl enlisted in the United States Army and went to a training camp in Northern California. By the way, it is not lost on me that the last name Farrell, although spelled differently, is used to describe an animal who has escaped from domestication and become wild. But let's move on. Joining the military proved to be a mistake for Earl. He was quickly overwhelmed by his duties assigned to him. After serving nighttime guard duty, just six weeks after he enlisted, Earl went AWOL, absent without leave. But that was not the end of his military service. In fact, he joined three more times, once in the Navy as a cook, but he went AWOL after he felt oppressed by the chores assigned to him. Then, as a private in the medical corps, he deserted because, he claimed, his hemorrhoids were bothering him. His last attempt in the military did not end in desertion, but it also did not end well. Back in the Navy, Earl refused to work. Instead, he read the Bible and shouted about the end of the world and the coming of the great beast. This, of course, cost him his friends, the few that he had, but it also led to multiple punishments. In 1918, after weeks of complaining about headaches and refusing to leave his cot, Earl was sent to a naval hospital for three weeks for psychological evaluation. Nine days after his 21st birthday, Earl was committed to Napa State Mental Hospital. There, he performed well on the battery of psychological tests. The doctor who examined him concluded that he was, quote, not violent, homicidal, or destructive. I'm not sure what to say about this, except that he was obviously incorrect. What was happening was that Earl, at this time, had enough self-control that he could fake it. Earl escaped the mental hospital only to be returned six weeks later, but he kept trying. In the 13 months he spent there, Earl made four attempts. One happened the very day he'd been brought back from a previous attempt. But in May of 1919, Earl ran away for the last time. The war had ended and the Navy refused to pay for any more of his treatment. They also formally discharged him and the hospital did not bother to look for him. Why would they? The psychiatrist who treated Earl reported that he was improved and harmless. Earl was still considered a fugitive. He fled to his Aunt Lillian's and assumed a new name, Evan Fuller. He found work as a janitor at a hospital, and there he met a cleaning woman named Mary Teresa Martin. Mary was 58 years old, 38 years older than Earl. She and Earl formed an attachment. He was the only other adult that Mary felt comfortable around. They also connected through their love of scripture. On August 5th, 1919, Mary Teresa and Earl were married. But Mary was not prepared for the behavior she encountered once they wed. His lack of personal hygiene disgusted her, 
and his peculiar eating habits dismayed her. His clothing choices mortified her. Not only were his clothes flamboyantly mismatched, but like in childhood, he ended up with soil and tattered clothes by the end of every day. Mary soon stopped trying to change his peculiarities, and like his Aunt Lillian, she remained loyal to him. Earl's behavior continued to grow more and more erratic. For example, he told Mary he was buying her a house, but tried to pay for it with just two dollars. He would also get up at three in the morning and tell Mary he was going to look for a job. She later described him as childlike and that she was cast in the role of both his mother and his wife. Earl's jealousy knew no bounds. He grew angry if Mary even said hello to a stranger on the street, male or female. Earl hated that she was attentive to her friends, which made Mary nervous to speak to anyone, even her own family. But it was Earl's lust and sexual demands that Mary found most distasteful. If she refused him, he would masturbate relentlessly until she fled the bedroom. Even when she was sick, he wanted sex and forced himself on her. Mary's brother wanted her to leave him, especially after he discovered Earl silently conversing with the ceiling. But Mary was devoutly Roman Catholic, and divorce was forbidden. Earl suffered headaches since childhood, probably related to the syphilis. But after he and Mary wed, they became more persistent and painful. These headaches got worse after another TBI. Earl had fallen out of the upper branches of a tree and landed on his head. He received a serious concussion and large head wound, but after just two days, he fled the hospital and went home. According to true crime author Harold Schechter's book on Earl, Bestio, as the frequency of his headaches increased, his behavior became more unpredictable. He began to see faces on walls. Quote, his religious preoccupation grew more extreme too, burgeoning into a kind of mania. Earl compared himself to paintings of Christ believing he looked just like him. When Mary asked her priest what to do, he told her, quote, kindness can cure insanity, and she should bear with it. The couple moved to Palo Alto, and both of them took jobs at the same private school. When Earl tried to pick a fight with a co-worker who Mary was talking with, she had had enough. Earl told Mary that the people at the school were against him and they were leaving. For the first time in their marriage, Mary rebelled and told him that she was staying, but that he should leave. Furious, he left, but came back later that day asking her to take him back. When she refused, he began to rage, insisting that someone or something was keeping her away from him. After telling Mary that he would get her back, Earl raised his hands as if to strangle her. She screamed and ran to a co-worker's house, who then called the police on Earl. He left, but continued to threaten his wife. Mary did not see her husband again until three months later when she visited him in jail after the attack on the 12-year-old girl in the cellar. It was then that she found out not only had her husband been in a mental hospital before he met her, but Earl had married her with a fake identity. When Mary arrived at the jail, 
she was shocked by Earl's appearance. After threatening suicide and plucking out his eyebrows with his fingernails, the police bound him in a straitjacket and secured him to the bed. He was extremely agitated and screamed about the faces on the wall who were mocking him. At this point, Earl was experiencing both visual and auditory hallucinations. And let me tell you something about those. They're never nice. For example, the faces on the wall were mocking him. The voices do not say, hey, you look great today. Have a wonderful time. You're a fabulous person. Oh, no, they do not. They are punishing, they are abusive, and they are frightening. There can be many reasons why people experience these, but I can say with certainty that the cause of this in Earl was a thought disorder, namely schizophrenia. In order to avoid jail for the assault on the 12-year-old girl, his wife and aunt had him committed once again to the same hospital and doctor he saw before. And once again, Earl tried to escape. He was not successful and was locked in his room for weeks. But this time, Earl's illness could not be denied. The doctor who once claimed Earl was fine, amended his statement and declared that he was, quote, a constitutional psychopath with outbreaks of psychoses. After the initial intake, the doctor only made one entry per month. While the doctor wrote that the hallucinations had stopped, Earl had become quietly rageful, which means he was silently seething and once again escaped the hospital multiple times. Earl remained at the facility for two years and four months, after which he escaped again and went to his sister's. But Earl scared Lillian so much that she turned him away, giving him money and food. Lillian then called the police, and two days later, Earl was sent back to the hospital where he remained for 16 more months. Despite his suicidal threats, the hospital released Earl on March 10, 1925, once again notating, quote, discharged as improved. Although Earl persuaded Mary to come back to him, he soon took off and made his way up to Northern California. It was then that he began to kill. In most of Earl's murders, he strangled his victims and then raped them post-mortem. This is a paraphilia, which is an abnormal sexual desire that usually involves extreme or dangerous activities, and it is primarily seen in men. Necrophilia is defined as a sexual interest in or sexual contact with dead bodies, and frequently the body they defile has to be one they murdered. In other words, they defile their victim's corpse. In 2010, Dr. Louis Schlesinger and Michelle Stein did a study on sexual homicide and necrophilia. They found in cases that do not start with sexual homicide, quote, the offender's desire to have an unresisting partner may not always be applicable in cases where this rare paraphilia is connected to sexual murder. But when homicide is involved, the perpetrator does so to further desecrate and destroy their victims. In the words of a notorious serial killer, Edmund Kemper, who was a necrophiliac, he did it to defile the victim's corpse. As Earl's victim count grew, his need to murder would climb, he would commit the homicide, and then the need to do it would taper off for weeks. 
The FBI would later term this an emotional cooling off period, which soon became the determining factor when judging killers as serial killers. But during his murder rages, he no longer just targeted older women. He now victimized any female who was gettable. As the law closed in around him, the risk of being discovered only seemed to excite him even more. Earl could not stop himself, and it does not appear that he wanted to. But like most criminals, he eventually made mistakes. And once Earl crossed into Canada in 1927, his mistakes would lead to his demise. Harold Schechter wrote, though it is possible that he was possessed by self-destructive impulses, a secret desire to be punished for his crimes, there are other equally plausible explanations for his crimes. Arrogance is one. Whatever the reason, suicidal feelings, hubris, or delusional thinking, Earl Leonard Nelson had left clues in his wake from the moment he arrived in Winnipeg on Wednesday, June 8th. And by Tuesday, the police had finally picked up his trail. As they closed in on him, the chief inspector of the Manitoba Provincial Police told the press, quote, the gorilla's career of strangling is about to end suddenly. He has blundered along a road that will take him to the gallows. And just a few hours later, that prediction came true. Earl Leonard Nelson was in handcuffs. After a preliminary hearing on June 23, 1927, Earl Leonard Nelson was moved to a death cell at the local jail. The cell, a steel door with a six-inch square-slotted window, was built of cement and steel. Earl was placed in the special cell normally reserved for condemned prisoners to prevent him from escaping, and also from mobs of people trying to lynch him. During his preliminary hearing on June 27th, he was only charged with two of his murders. Earl told the judge that murder was not possible for a man of his high Christian ideals, and he pled not guilty. He was also indicted for murders in San Francisco, Portland, Detroit, Philadelphia, and Buffalo. Throughout the trial, newspapers reported that Earl showed, quote, a pose of complete indifference. He sat in the prisoner's dock with his head thrown back and his eyes closed. Earl's attorney asked for clemency because of Earl's insanity. Among the 60 witnesses, only two of them testified for the defense. Earl's aunt and his wife, who hoped for a not guilty by reason of insanity verdict. The trial lasted five days. On Saturday, November 5, 1927, the jury deliberated for only 48 minutes before finding him guilty of murder. He was sentenced to death by hanging. Before the trapdoor beneath his feet was sprung, he told spectators, quote, I am innocent. I stand innocent before God and man. I forgive those who have wronged me and ask forgiveness for those I have injured. God have mercy. God may have had mercy, but the justice system did not. Earl Leonard Nelson was executed in Winnipeg, Canada on January 13, 1928, 
He was 30 years old. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Director of Research is Anne Liu. Mix and sound design by Joshua Morales. Supervising audio producer, Maxwell Carney. Head of audio, Tom Monahan. With audio assistance from Katie Corpy and Matt Dyson. Editorial support, Alexander McCall. Host support from Allison Sandler. Renee Levesque is our production manager. Jada Williams is our production coordinator. Oscar Guido is the producer from Tree Fort Media. From Amazon Music and Wondery, producer is Stephanie Wachnin. And the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Tree Fort and Marshall Louie and Erin O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Tree Fort Media.